So, again, we're, we're picking up in Matthew chapter 7, going to be finishing up the Sermon on the Mount today. But again, I just want to remind you of where we've been. Jesus had just warned the Jews about two choices. And the choices basically boiled down to belief or unbelief. To me, it's interesting that that's the choice that's always been there, whether it's belief or unbelief. You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and you see that God gave Adam a choice. You can believe my word or not. Of course, we know the story. Adam chose not to believe God and to listen to the serpent. And that messed all of us up to this very day. And even with the Old Covenant, God gave Israel a choice whether they would believe His Word or they would not believe His Word. Please keep in mind, the Old Covenant was, and I've said this many times, was a conditional covenant. And God specified what would happen if they believed. They would be blessed. No armies would succeed against them. Their crops would not fail. Uh, insects would not be able to devour their crops if they had faith in God. He would protect them. But the opposite was also true in the covenant. If they did not believe, their crops would fail. They would see diseases. Their enemies would defeat them. They would go off into captivity. And that was the Mosaic law, this conditional covenant between God and Israel. And so it's important for us to understand that because Jesus is preaching this sermon under the old covenant. So he over and over again reminds them of the promises of God and the threats of God, because it was a conditional covenant. We have to keep that in mind. And by the way, as far as the faith factor goes, that's still true for the new covenant. It's all about belief in God. We're no longer under the old covenant. The old covenant is obsolete, but it still boils down to, do you believe what God said? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Salvation has always been based on faith, whether you believe God's word or reject it. So, Jesus, as I mentioned, is now at the end of his sermon, and he's going to now warn the Jews about false prophets. And newsflash, this isn't anything new. As a matter of fact, we go back, and we will go back into the Old Testament, to the Old Covenant, and we'll see where Moses warned them about false prophets. And he gave them additional information about an important prophet who was to come. So Jesus again gave them two options. Believe God's word or, and Mosaic law or reject God's word and the Mosaic law. And then remember that Jesus specifically said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He fulfilled the law and the prophets even though they rejected him, he still did this. And again, Jesus' call to the Jews was to faith in God and to believe in him. And so when Jesus reminded them about what the Mosaic law said about false prophets, this was again just a reminder. And Jesus constantly referred to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, because that's what they were under. And he was explaining things to them that they had misunderstood or had been taught incorrectly about the Old Covenant. And again, the key to understanding what Jesus is saying in these final words in this sermon is context. You have to keep the context in mind. And again, the context is the Old Covenant. So these verses spoke, we're going to be talking about false prophets, these verses spoke about false prophets. And when Jesus refers to fruit... He is speaking about the fruit of either a true prophet or a false prophet. And I want to give a warning here because so many Christians look at this whole idea about you'll know them by their fruit and they turn into fruit inspectors. Can I just tell you something? Jesus didn't call us to be fruit inspectors. And the fruit in this context is referring to the fruit of very specifically False prophets, because he's warning them about false prophets that were going to come. The reality is, if you think that you're going to be the new fruit inspector for Christianity, here's what you're going to end up becoming. Self-righteous, holier than thou, and people are going to look at you and think you're some sort of, well, let's call you a spiritual jerk. Because you're going to be judging everyone. You're going to be judgmental. And you'll be looking at all the things that they do wrong. 
And it's not going to go well for you either, let me just say that. So God is not calling us to be fruit inspectors. This is a very specific context dealing with false prophets. And he's going to give them very specific guidelines of how they can identify the false prophets. And you know where those guidelines are going to come from? The Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant, because that's what they're living under. So long before Jesus warned them about false prophets, Moses warned them about false prophets. We go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell letter, so to speak. He repeats the law to them, and he's not going into the promised land. God already told him that. You're not going in. He got to see the land by God's grace, but he wasn't going in. So in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through the first part of verse 3, we read this from Moses. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you by mirac- you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or, or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, so he does something miraculous, and he says, let us follow other gods. Gods you have not known, and let us worship them. You will not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. So he tells them, if somebody comes and does some sort of miraculous thing, sign or wonder, but yet at the same time he tells you not to believe God in his word, he is a false prophet. Don't listen to him. Don't follow him. Matter of fact, false prophets were supposed to be executed. Just a little fact that we ought to toss out there as well. So again, we get over into chapter 18, and Moses warns them again about false prophets. And so we read this. If what a prophet claims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. He's a false prophet. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. So again, a false prophet was someone who told the Jewish people to reject God's word. And it didn't matter if they did something miraculous or they prophesied something that came true. If they were rejecting God's word, that was unbelief in God and His word. They were false prophets. They were not to be listened to. And actually, they should be executed. Because they were speaking against God's word. So a false prophet was someone who claimed to speak for God, but did not. And the proof that they were not God's prophet was, one, their prediction didn't come true, but two, they contradicted God's law. That was the evidence that they were a false prophet. So after inviting the Jews to choose between belief and unbelief, Jesus now warns them about false prophets that are going to contradict what Jesus is telling them. They're going to tell them that Jesus' words are not true, that he doesn't represent God. And they are then False prophets, they're speaking against God's word. Verse 15, he continues. Watch out for false prophets, for they come, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now, Jewish history, all you have to do is read the Old Testament, and you can see false prophets in the Old Testament speaking to the nation of Israel, trying to lead them away, and particularly with the northern kingdom when the split came. Because they had all ungodly kings and they had prophets that would prop them up, so to speak. And they would preach against God and His Word and the Mosaic Law and the promises that God made to the Jewish people. So remember, a prophecy was not just a prediction. We have a false understanding about the concept of a prophet. What a prophet occasionally did was predict the future. And sometimes that future would be more than a thousand years down the road. We have prophecies in the Old Testament about where Jesus would be born. What tribe he would come from. Some of the things that he would do in his life. We have these prophecies about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But the vast majority of the time... A true prophet was trying to bring the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, back to God. Telling them that they had gone astray. Telling them that they weren't believing God's word. So most of the time, prophets were preachers. Not of the future, but of going back to the truth of God's word. By the way, in that sense, there are prophets today. 
people who are speaking the word of God, the truth of God, and drawing people to Jesus Christ. As far as predicting the future goes, I haven't seen any in my lifetime. As a matter of fact, we have people in Christianity today that claim to be prophets and predict the future. And you know what happens? Over and over again, their prophecies don't come true. Thank God we're not under the old covenant because we take them out and stone them. We don't do that. They're false prophets. So we need to understand what Jesus is talking about. False prophets took the name of the Lord in vain and violated the commandment about not using the Lord's name in vain. Again, another misunderstanding in Christianity today. I had somebody just kind of chew me out because one day at church I said, Oh my God. And they said, you use the Lord's name in vain. First of all, his name isn't God. Now maybe if I would have said, maybe if I would have said, oh my Yahweh. Which I don't think I've ever said that until right now. <laughs> but that wouldn't have even been using the Lord's name in vain. The concept of using the Lord's name in vain is pretending to represent God when you don't. Pretending to say that God told you this when he didn't. That is using the Lord's name in vain. You're pretending that God said something to you when he didn't. And these false prophets would say, Oh, Jehovah, Yahweh said something to me and it contradicted God's word. They knew they were false prophets. And by the way, when people tell you that they know when Jesus is going to return, false prophet. And there's been people that have written books about when Christ is going to return. All we know is this, he's coming back. We don't know when. We do not know the hour. We do not know the day. We just know he's coming back. I can tell you this though, it's closer today than it was yesterday. That we do know. But this is the idea of false prophets and using the Lord's name in vain. They were pseudo prophetes. They were people who were false prophets, claiming to represent or speak for God when they did not. And Jesus is saying, they're coming. They're coming. So Jesus said the false prophets would come outwardly. They looked like sheep. They looked like believers. But inwardly they were ferocious wolves. They were unbelievers. And the key difference was they weren't believers. They claimed it, but it wasn't true. So sheep again were, were the believers. The wolves were the false prophets who were the unbelievers. And again, false prophets are still around. They claim to be Christians. They claim to represent God. They claim to speak for God, and they don't. How do we know? If they contradict God's word, they're not speaking for God. That's the bottom line. It's what does God's word say. Again, they, they're still around. They're still preaching in Jesus' name, but they're actually preaching in vain using the Lord's name in vain, because they do not represent Him. Jesus said the way into the kingdom was narrow. The false prophets would say the way is wide. And even today we tell people there is one way to the Father. It is through Jesus Christ, not my words, His words. And people will say there's many ways to the Father. No there are not. And if someone tells you there are many ways to the Father, then they're a false prophet. They're not speaking the truth. There's only one way. So Jesus said righteousness was a gift. False prophets will tell you righteousness is earned. Oh, you got to do this. you got to keep the Mosaic Law. And by the way, you had to keep all the other rules that they added to the Mosaic Law or you weren't going to get to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so again, they were contradicting what Jesus was telling them. False prophets helped to destroy the nation of Israel. And false prophets today are helping to destroy Christianity. Because they say things that are not true. And so many times the things they're saying involve works without faith. And you can't get into the kingdom without faith in Jesus 
Christ. He is the only way. So again, then Jesus told them how the false prophets were going to be identified. It's actually very simple. He says in verses 16 and 17, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? I mean, this is an easy illustration here. It's like, well, duh. Well, how are you going to know the false prophets? So every good tree bears good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. And again, what he's talking about here are the false prophets. He said they would know if a person was a false prophet. And of course, the question is, how would they know? Now, the word know, the word that is translated known means to know, to know upon a, a specific mark, to know about, about something that is very specific. And what is the very specific thing they're going to use to judge whether somebody is a false prophet? The Word of God. The Mosaic Law. By the way, that's what we can use today. We can use God's Word. We can use what Paul, Peter, uh, James, John, Jude preached in the, the letters to the churches. If somebody is contradicting those letters, then they're not speaking the truth. And that's what we have to key on. It always goes back to the Word of God. So their ability to know a false prophet was based on God's Word in the Mosaic Law specifically. That was their guideline. This is, again, a very specific knowing here. There were no options. It's based on, thus saith the Lord. And it's not going to contradict the Mosaic Law. Recognition of a false prophet was not based on external works. They may perform miraculous signs, but it's not based on what they do. It's based on what they believe and what they say about God's Word. And in this case, because they're under the Mosaic Law, what they say about the Law of Moses. And again, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus was not contradicting the Law of Moses. He wasn't adding to it. He wasn't subtracting from it. He was preaching about the law of Moses, because they were all still underneath it, Jesus included. So if a prophet was true, what they taught, their fruit was always going to be based on the word of God. It would agree with the Mosaic law. And that's how, if God was giving them the message as a true prophet, everything that they preached to Israel was based on the word of God. So their fruit was always true. How do you know? It was based on God's word. It's a very simple concept. The fruit never contradicted God's word. The fruit never contradicted the Mosaic law. The fruit never contradicted spiritual truth. That's a, that's a true prophet. The prophet that spoke the truth of God's word never spoke bad fruit. And Jesus is giving a very specific concept here. If they're speaking for God, how do you know their fruit's good? Because it agrees with God's word. Because it points to the Messiah. Because the Old Testament pointed very specifically to who the Messiah was going to be. And what the Messiah was going to do. So if they're pointing to the Messiah. And they're representing God. And they're speaking the truth. It's always going to agree with God's word. It will always be good fruit. See the reality is. You can't speak God's word in truth. And disagree with God. You can't do that. It's like when people say, well, you know, Jesus said, be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. And people say, well, you know, Jesus really didn't mean that. What he meant was, just be a mature believer. Oh, let me tell you something. When Jesus said to those Jewish people living under the law, you better be perfect, that's exactly what he meant. Why did he want them to know that? Because anything less, you weren't getting there. Oh, wait a minute. There's a solution. Jesus Christ is the solution. They couldn't achieve righteousness. He wanted them to understand it. You can't be perfect. You can't achieve righteousness. You have to be perfect in order to get into God's kingdom. Guess what? You can't do it. So what do you need? A Savior. And that's what Jesus wanted them to understand. And in everything Jesus said, he never contradicted God's word. Never, not once. And that's what a true prophet does. They proclaim the truth of God's word. Even when people don't like what it says, they proclaim the truth. 
So again, remember the evidence is a false prophet. According to Moses was, they led them away from God. They led them away from the Mosaic law. They led them away from God's word. That was evidence of a false prophet. Verse 18, he continues, A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. So a true prophet of God never spoke lies about God's word. Otherwise, he wasn't representing God. He always spoke the truth about God's word. He always spoke the truth about the Mosaic law because they were speaking for God. It was impossible for them to speak God's message and contradict God. If you're speaking God's message, it's not going to contradict God's word. That's an impossibility. Because if it did, then God would be like some kind of confused God. And that's not the way it works. That's one thing is for sure, folks. God is never confused. Never confused. So Moses pointed them to Deuteronomy, or Moses wrote Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, and it pointed them always to the word of God. The true prophet never contradicts God's word. The false prophet never preaches God's word because he never would get an actual message from God. It just wouldn't happen. God's not given messages to false prophets. So they can claim that they're given a message from God, but it is absolutely not true, never will be true. Because they are they're unbelievers to begin with. So they're not even hearing God. They're not even listening to God. A false prophet could never speak for God because God never gave messages for them to speak. Any message they ever spoke was made up in their own minds and the evidence of that would eventually be it contradicted God's word. It tried to pull people away from God. A false prophet, that's what they want to do. They want attention focused on themselves not on our Lord and Savior. That's evidence. Verses 19 and 20, he continues. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. Again, every false prophet would be cut down, destroyed because they contradicted God's word, and the bottom line was they didn't believe they didn't have faith in God. If they had faith in God, they wouldn't have been contradicting God's word. So he's telling them what is going to happen. They were unbelievers, and every unbeliever is going to be judged. Every unbeliever. The reality is, folks, our sins have already been taken care of because we're believers in Jesus Christ. So what will we be judged for? Nothing. Nothing. Because Jesus already took care of it on the cross. And because we confess Jesus as Lord, we had faith in Him, we are forgiven 100% past, present, future, and we have His life right now. That's what we have. So every false prophet was going to be cut down. And so Jesus reminded the Jews false prophets would be recognized because of what? Because they contradicted God's word and the Mosaic law, which was God's word. So as Jesus is finishing his sermon, he reminded the Jews how they could enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because what is he going back to? Bottom line is faith. Believe. That is the bottom line. So enter the kingdom of heaven. So first of all, Remember, Jesus called it the kingdom of heaven. He referred to a spiritual kingdom. Here's the, the sad reality for the Jewish people. If they would have put their faith in Christ as a nation, they would have entered into the spiritual kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. And that would have allowed the physical kingdom to come. Because the reality is when we look at the Old Testament and the prophecies about the return of Jesus Christ, what is one of the key things that's going to happen with the Jewish people? As a group of people, they are going to believe in Jesus Christ. They are going to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And as Zechariah tells us, they are going to look upon the one they pierced and mourn as one mourns for a son. They're going to realize the mistake they made and they're going to put their faith in Jesus Christ and He is bringing the kingdom, the physical kingdom as well. 
But we know the story. We know they did not believe. We know that they shouted out, let his blood be upon us and our children. Be careful what you ask God for. Particularly when you're under the old covenant and it's a conditional covenant and you say, we reject the Messiah and let his blood fall upon us. Let his, let his punishment fall upon us because we know history and we know in 70 AD their punishment came through the Romans. But God told them, if you don't believe then your enemies will destroy you. You will be taken away into captivity. And how many times did that take place in Jewish history? We got the Assyrians, we have the Babylonians, we have the Medes and the Persians, we have the Greeks, and then we have the Romans. Over and over again. So on to verse 21, he writes, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father is who is in heaven will enter. So entrance into the kingdom is not based on what a person merely said. It's based on whether they actually did the will of God. Now, the question comes up in this verse is, well, what's the will of God? Now, the Jewish mindset would say, it's keeping the Mosaic law. But we know that doesn't work. Because the Mosaic Law never saved anyone. The Mosaic Law was never designed to save anyone. The Mosaic Law was designed to bring a nation into existence that would be different than the nations around them. That would be blessed by God if they believed. And that nation would bring the Messiah into the world who would be the Messiah for the Jews but also the Savior of the world. But the Mosaic Law never saved a person because it's always been about faith in God. Always been about faith in God. All you have to do is read Paul's writings and he will specifically tell you no one was ever saved by the Mosaic Law. But I'm going to tell you what, there were a lot of people that were judged by the Mosaic Law. And that is the reality. So again, what is this will of God? Well, the will of God is summed up in what Moses said in Deuteronomy. Again, going back to the Mosaic Law, specifically what Moses said to the Jewish people. And this is what he said. Your Lord, the Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your country, countrymen. You shall listen to him. And the Jewish people understood that this was a messianic prophecy. And so what Moses is saying, you know, hey, I'm going away. I'm not going into the promised land. I blew it. But there's no one coming, and he is going to be a prophet, and he's going to be like me. I mean, look at the things that God did through Moses. Look at the things that Jesus did, because he was God. And so he's preaching to the Jewish people, and Moses' words were, listen to him. Very simple. If they'd actually listened to Moses, they would have put their faith in the Messiah. They would have believed. But they didn't believe what Moses said. They didn't believe what the prophets said about who this Messiah would be. It was right there in the Word of God, and they rejected it. Oh, they would say things. What prophet ever came out of Nazareth? Wait a minute. He was born in Bethlehem. Oh, time out. That's what the prophecy said. He would be born in Bethlehem. He may have grown up in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah, a son of David, of the line that was not cursed by God. All these prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Moses' words were, listen to him. The problem was they didn't listen to and believe. That was the problem. They understood again this was a messianic prophecy. As a matter of fact, Peter, and I believe it was his second message, said this about that prophecy. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Peter understood it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's speaking after the resurrection. 
When the church is now established, but he's still speaking to the Jewish people and tell them, you need to do what Moses said. Listen to this guy. He's the one. He rose from the dead. You ought to pay attention to that. But once again, as a people, the Jews still rejected Jesus Christ. So the will of God was to believe in Jesus, their prophesied Messiah. That's the key. It doesn't matter what you do religiously. There's a lot of religious people today that don't believe in Jesus Christ. There's religious people all over the world. There's religious Christians that haven't put their faith in Jesus Christ. Too many. It's all about faith in Jesus Christ. So it didn't matter what words they uttered. The bottom line was they needed to believe in Jesus Christ. They needed to have faith in Jesus Christ. And the reality is if we continue on in verses 22 and 23, Jesus is going to point out, you know, what you say and what you did doesn't mean a whole lot. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Then, Jesus, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Keep that word in mind. They claimed to do many things. And the fact is, Jesus did not dis deny their external works. But their works did not make them right with God because works never make you right with God. Any more than keeping the Mosaic Law would make you right with God if you don't believe in God. So it's not about what you say. It's not even about what you do. It again is about doing the will of God. And that's very specific. And that is to believe in Jesus Christ. By the way, that hasn't changed in the New Covenant either. You know, in the Old Covenant, you had 613 commandments, rules. We got two in the New Covenant. Believe in Jesus Christ and let Him live through you. That's it. And it all centers around faith in Jesus Christ. By the way, the New Covenant is a whole lot simpler than the Old Covenant. I'd, I'd gladly take two over 613, which couldn't save me anyway. That's the reality. So, Jesus told them that he did not know them. They were not in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ because they did not have faith in him. You could be a Jew, but if you don't believe in God, you're not in the covenant relationship with God. God established that covenant with the, with the Jewish people, individually with all the people in Judaism. The bottom line was, did they believe? Did they have faith in God? Because faith was the only thing that would make them work. And Jesus is saying to them, you didn't believe, you didn't do the will of God, which was to believe in me. So you're not covered by the covenant. You're outside the covenant. And I want to mention again, in the new covenant, we also have a covenant relationship with God. But in the old covenant, it was a covenant made with God and the nation of Israel. Do you realize the new covenant is a covenant made with God and God? We just happen to be the beneficiaries of it through faith in Jesus Christ. So that's why we can't blow the covenant. Because God's not going to blow. Who, blow. who blew the old covenant? The Jewish people did because of unbelief. For us, it's a covenant between God and God. We are the beneficiaries. And what does the Bible say? What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. Once you're in Christ, you didn't put yourself there. God did through your faith. And you can't take yourself out, which you really wouldn't want to do anyway. But even if somehow... In your lunacy, you just said, I don't want anything to do with Christ. If you're in Christ, you're not getting removed. It's not an option. So that covenant relationship was based on faith and the Mosaic law. And rather than practice the law, what did they do? They practiced lawlessness. They didn't believe in it. They didn't believe in God. Oh, they did religious things. But they bottom line didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ. And so now what they're doing is rather than what the law told them to do, they're doing lawlessness. They're doing whatever. 
And the bottom line was, they didn't have faith. That's the will of God. Which meant, this practice lawlessness, it means to work. It means to speak the opposite of keeping the law. So what was the sign of a false prophet? They spoke the opposite of the Mosaic law. They didn't believe the Mosaic law. So all oh, oh, these guys were doing these religious things, and impressive religious things. The bottom line was, they didn't have faith in God. They were religious. It's, you know, religion is the curse of the world. They rejected the Mosaic law. They rejected God. But they did religious things because religious things make people feel better. Oh, look at me. Look at how religious I am. I go to church every Sunday. Look at all the nice things I do for people. And, and God's question is, what did you do with Jesus Christ? Did you believe in him? Well, no. Bye. The reality is, though, while a person is still alive, they still have the option to change their mind. To change their mind. So from there, Jesus talks to them about two choices. He talks to them about two foundations, if you will. Verse 24, he continues. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So we know that this is the summation of the sermon because of that key word there, therefore. Jesus is summing up. Jesus' words refer to everything that he has said in this sermon. And it's all pointing to God. And now it's all pointing them to, to go back to the law. But more importantly, it's pointing them to him as the Messiah. And he wanted, what he wants from them is he wants them to believe it. He wants them to have faith in it. So the bottom line was, did they believe what he said? Faith was necessary for entrance into the spiritual kingdom. And the illustration is very easy to understand. Verse 25. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So believing Jesus was a wise decision that would stand against any storm. Now, I want to point something out here. If they believed in Jesus, then they would be following the Mosaic law. And what could stand against Israel? Matter of fact, they wouldn't have even needed the Iron Dome. Because God would have been their dome. They couldn't have been destroyed if they had been faithful to God Follow the Mosaic law. They would have recognized Jesus Christ because the Mosaic law spoke of who he was. And Jesus demonstrated who he was over and over and over again. But they were not listening. Because they were wrapped up in religion. Verses 26 and 27 he says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. So the choice was simple. Listen to Jesus' words and believe. Trust Him as Messiah. The opposite choice was spiritual disaster which would lead to physical disaster and it did so the choice was especially important for the nation of Israel to make for the people of Israel to believe in Jesus Christ because if they had the spiritual kingdom would have welcomed them but the physical kingdom would have come however we know the history we know that they rejected Jesus because they listened to the religious leaders they rejected Jesus and when he was up there, they said, crucify him. You know, the reality is that if Jesus had actually been a blasphemer, the punishment would have been stoning. But the Jews didn't want Jesus to be stoned. They wanted him to be on a tree. Why? Because in God's word, what they were not listening to, what they did not believe, it said, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed by God. And that's exactly what Jesus became. He was cursed 
He took our sin. He paid the price for our sin and was cursed, so to speak, and he was actually fulfilling God's will because he died on that cross to pay for all the sins. As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His sacrifice was enough for every single sin in the world. That doesn't make you saved. you got to believe in order to be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But you got to call. You have to believe. So again, we continue on verses 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So they were amazed or literally they were astonished at Jesus' teaching. But what they did do, or rather what did they do with his teaching? Well, the reality is, because we know history, that most of them would reject his teaching. And so their unbelief brought spiritual disaster upon themselves and eventually physical disaster upon the nation. And of course, in 70 AD, the nation, the religion was destroyed because Titus destroyed the temple. See, the Roman armies tolerated other religions and they would let them practice their religions with certainly some restraints. They let the Jews practice their religion but the history of the Jews was rebellion and rebellion and rebellion and the Romans understood that one way to squash the rebellion permanently was to take away their religious center to in essence destroy their religion because that was their motivation and when the temple was destroyed even to this day Judaism can't be fulfilled because there is no temple. They cannot offer the Day of Atonement sacrifices. There are no priests. There are no sacrifices. There's no tabernacle. There's no temple. It's just not there, and they can't function. What they do is they lie to themselves. They lie to themselves. I say that because I ask my father's wife, who goes to a synagogue, it's a Messianic Jewish synagogue, but I asked her about that. I said, how do the Jewish people, they, they know that there's no temple, there's no Day of Atonement sacrifices. She says, well, they just rationalize. And I said, so in other words, <coughs> they lie to themselves. And she said, yeah, that's really the bottom line. Because in 70 AD, the Jews no longer could function in their religion. And they brought it upon themselves because they did not believe Jesus Christ. This is the end of his sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And the reality is that Jesus over and over was pointing them back to the truth of God's word. And that truth of God's word that pointed to him. And he wanted them to believe in him. And then under the Mosaic law, he wanted them to keep the Mosaic law. But the first most important thing was faith. And that has not changed. Faith. Without faith, the writer of Hebrews says, it is impossible to please God. Faith is always, has always been, will always be the number one most important thing.